our next topic is rocket cargo point to point space transport. Uh, this discussion is going to be led by Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Narav Lad, a 15 year Air Force veteran with rich experience in logistics, materials, and supply chain management. He's also the principal investigator for space transportation cooperative research and development agreements with US Transcom. Lieutenant Colonel Ladd serves as Chief Airlift Branch, U.S. Transportation Command. Uh, in this role, he supports Transcom's airlift and sea lift the emergency preparedness programs to ensure mobility, capacity, and capability. Additionally, Lieutenant Colonel Ladd coordinates and interface with joint interagency and commercial partners to manage airlift policy and programs. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Anderson. I'm also the Director of Outreach at the Space Force Association. I'm going to be uh, tag team in this with Lieutenant Colonel Ladd and uh, Eric Sumby, thanks for that great lead in to our topic today. And that is, you know, the Space Force is, yes, uh, slightly misunderstood by some. However, all the branches of the military will and currently do rely on space capabilities. And what we're going to discuss today is a really fascinating one for many of us that have been in the logistics business or flying airplanes uh, for many years. And part of that education is. I'm going, to, I'm going to share a screen. This is kind of a, a global view of the way the Department of Defense looks at the world. And if you look at the different colors and the locations on this map, starting on the right hand side with the US Indo-Pacific Command. So there is a four star general or admiral in charge of every one of these geographic areas of the world. So if there's a conflict or a situation, it could be a humanitarian relief uh, support effort in Japan. If you, know, when they, if you think back to when they had the the nuclear mishap over there, there is a four-star Navy Admiral that would be in charge of that. And then the other services, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and now the Space Force, they provide the people to support that commander. You know, for the last 20 years or so, if you look at the center of the chart there, U.S. Central Command, we think Iraq, Afghanistan, that's kind of been uh, what we've been talking about for years. And even us, as we sit here in the United States, we fall under United States Northern Command. That was established right after 9-11. And if, if you look at Northern Command in the upper left, and then just appropriately off the white part, but out into space is United States Space Command. That is often confused with the United States Space Force. So that was stood up in the summer of 2019, well before, months before the Space Force. And the reason it's sitting out there in space is it is also a geographic combatant command, just like the other ones, European Command, Africa Command, and Space Command. Space Command is uniquely in charge of everything 100 kilometers and higher from a Department of Defense perspective. So like I said before, you can have a Navy Admiral, you can have a Army General, an Air Force General, a Marine Four-Star General in charge of any one of these command, combatant commands. So imagine what service is currently the commander of United States Space Command. Most of you would probably assume it's a Space Force General, or at least an Air Force General. Ironically, he's an Army four-star general, and he took over from General Raymond, who's now the Chief, Chief, of, Staff, uh, Chief of Space Operations, who for a while was dual-hatted in that role. But this just shows that it is a joint effort for military operations across the globe. And what we're going to be talking about today is if you look in the purple on the left-hand side, there are also functional combatant commands. So these are not geographic in nature. Exactly as the word says, it's functional. So you've got Special Operations Command, Transportation Command, Strategic Command, so you think nuclear weapons on that one, and of course, United States Cyber Command. But the second one there is where Lieutenant Colonel Ladd works, and that's United States Transportation Command. So to make it simple, if the commander of United States European Command tells the Army Force Guard General in charge of US Transportation Command that the Secretary of Defense has authorized movements of troops, and I need you to move on. The United States Transportation Command's job is to get troops and cargo to all of those other geographic combatant commands. Now, it was very intentionally done that the United States Space Command was not put as a functional combatant command. It is defined as a geographic. So the commander of the United States Space Command could one day ask the United States Transportation Command to provide that transport to the space domain, 100 kilometers and above. But what we're going to talk about today is a very unique capability 
that the commander of United States Transportation Command highlighted in October of this last year at the NDTA conference on October 7th. And that is just like as the introduction was, it's United States Transportation Command's strategic vision for point to point space transport. So I'd like to welcome Lieutenant Colonel Ladd and I'll stop sharing the screen to turn it over to you. And Colonel Ladd, do you mind just giving us a brief overview to start with this vision that General Lyons announced? And then before it's all over, we're definitely gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Colonel Ladd. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you going over the, uh, the, the geographic combatant commands and the difference between them and the, the functional combatant commands. Um, you know, as you stated, US Transcom, really what we're, um, responsible for is conducting globally integrated uh, mobility operations uh, through all modes. Right now, a mode that we don't have obviously is space, and that is something that we are uh, definitely looking into. Uh, one thing that is appealing to U.S. Transportation Command uh, as it relates to point-to-point -point transportation is really the convergence of what we're seeing as four factors. Now, the fact is that the DOD writ large has been looking at space transportation I think since about the 1950s or 1960s, but the reason that it has not become a, uh, a capability that's been useful for terrestrial logistics is uh, because it hasn't been able to converge on what I think are really four, uh, four factors, cost, capability, cost, capacity, speed, and access. So we've always had the, the speed of the capability itself. Obviously, there's the onload and offload part of it, which uh, takes some time uh, and is definitely a factor in our uh, decision in terms of what mode that you want to transport uh, material with. Um, access is definitely an issue that is very appealing to U.S. Transportation Command. As the world becomes, uh, I would say, more contested, um, it is more and more difficult to move those items uh, in that example that uh, Matt had given, you know, to, to support the commander of U.S. Uh, European Command, whether it's restrictions on uh, airspace that we can overfly uh, to, to move cargo or just uh, uh, other, other, uh, other access issues. Uh, the fact that you can potentially go vertically up and vertically down removes a lot of barriers uh, for for U.S. Transportation Command. Uh, the second is, uh, or I'm sorry, the last is uh, cost and capacity. So until now, the capacity available uh, from launch has really been very minimal, at least as it relates to supporting uh, joint logistics or just something that is useful to, to move, whether it's personnel or, or cargo, obviously moving satellites into space uh, that is appropriately sized for the current uh, set of launch vehicles that are out there. Uh, and obviously if they become bigger then uh, you would want that capacity to increase. And the last is cost, um, you know, with the expendable launch vehicles that we've been using for such a long time, uh, you know, U.S. Transportation Command would never want to pay for a brand new airplane that you would use once and then throw it away. That would be very cost uh, ineffective uh, not just for U.S. Transportation Command, but for, for the taxpayer as well. So as these reusable um, launch vehicles uh, begin to come online, uh, we're seeing the cost starting to come down to a place where it potentially could be cost effective uh, and increase the decision space for not just our leaders in the DOD, but really for our national level leadership in order to support um, national security needs. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there for a moment. Yeah, thanks, Colonel Ladd. And you mentioned access, basing, and overflight challenges. When we looked at that globe, what, how can you better describe that to the audience? What is, uh, General Lyons often talks about that at Transportation Command, how this point-to-point -point space transport, the vision of this could eliminate some of those challenges. What are some of the everyday challenges as Transportation Command is trying to move troops or cargo around the world? And I think it's an important note, even though we looked at that map of all those headquarters. If you can imagine where the headquarters of United States Africa Command is, it's in Germany. The headquarters for the United States Central Command is in Tampa, Florida. So while we have these headquarters, and you may have heard about that in the last few months of the location of United States Space Command was in the news a lot. Really what they're talking about is about 1400 people in a staff job, no different than where is Starbucks headquarters located. It's in Seattle, but Starbucks is a global company. So if 85% of the United States fighting force, the men and women of the armed services are located in the United States and a conflict looks like it could begin somewhere else in the world, it's really the adversary looking at the United States ability to mobilize that 85% of the force. If you think back to 1990, 1991, 
and to move that force somewhere else in the world, that's a huge uh, opportunity for the enemy to have a vote. And if they can disrupt that logistics trail, it's important. So the access basing an overflight, again, Colonel Ladd, can you just give us some examples of in your career or just some things that might be a challenge to the logistics network? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as an example, just I guess from a personal standpoint, uh, supporting U.S. Transportation Command as a as a, as a as an airlift pilot, you know, attempting to move cargo um, within just the U.S. Indo PACOM theater, uh, you know, you can't overfly uh, areas such as China or uh, or Vietnam uh, without special uh, diplomatic clearances. This potentially allows you to circumvent some of those uh, some of those restrictions and really um, meet that uh, immediacy of need for the uh, not just the warfighter but really just anybody that uh, requires support uh, of the of U.S. Transportation Command. And I do want to highlight the fact that we do support more than just uh, the DoD. We also support uh, other interagency partners. Uh, does that does that answer your question as a as a sufficient example? Yeah, it sure does. And I think one other interesting, if you think of uh, supporting the other interagency partners, one of those that this capability comes to mind is often every year, the National Science Foundation, uh, to air quotes, it rents Department of Defense cargo aircraft, C-17s, to move troops, not troops, but personnel, mostly scientists and their cargo to Antarctica. It's called Operation Deep Freeze. And it is incredibly complicated when you think about the weather, the changing weather down in Antarctica, most of the airplanes take off usually from New Zealand. And you know it's about a five and a half hour flight from New Zealand down to Antarctica to a ice runway with not a lot of divert options down there, that part of the world. So uh, you know the goal of this when General Lyons rolled it out in October was, imagine a C-17 amount of cargo. So about 160,000 pounds of cargo to be delivered anywhere in the world within one hour. And then as industry got on board, they said, actually, most places are within 30 minutes. But when you start talking about the, the, the most difficult places, uh, it could take up to an hour. So, uh, Colonel Ladd, can you tell us where Transcom is with this right now? And it's been in the news. It's publicly stated that there is a relationship with SpaceX. And SpaceX is always in the news, especially with some recent um, tests that they've had that they couldn't stick the landing real well. But can you tell us where that, where that relationship's at with SpaceX? Yeah, so we have a uh, cooperative research and development agreement. It is uh, it is just that cooperative, and uh, there is no there are no transfer of funds associated with it. Uh, we are simply exchanging information to better understand uh, how to use a potential capability in the future. Um, as far as where we are at at U.S. Transportation Command, I will state that though we do have an agreement with SpaceX, we are truly interested in any uh, commercial provider that is uh, capable of providing um, a. A, a capability that kind of converges on those those four factors that we stated. Uh, one thing that I, I don't think we highlighted at the beginning is we are interested in a commercial capability. Uh, you know, you, as you look at um, research and development, you know, since the 19, what, 50s or 60s, you know, DOD and federal the federal government was initially the the largest funder of uh, uh, funding source rather of um, of research and development. And that has obviously flipped now. It is it is business and commercial industry that is leading that charge. And so we're being very intelligent about this and the fact that we're trying to partner with industry at the right time and insert our insert our uh, our requirements at the right place. So that way, uh, if a capability does come online, we don't need to reconfigure portions of it just to meet DOD specific needs. Um, in terms of how we would use it at U.S. Transportation Command, obviously you stated, um, you know, moving moving into Antarctica where there is just no logistics train that goes really all the way all the way there. Uh, other areas where you would uh, potentially want to use this for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or somewhere out in um, in the Pacific, or even some somewhere out in Africa, um, where just to get there in that uh, hour of need, especially for human humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, is uh, is truly essential. Yeah, thanks for that, Colonel Ladd. I think. Um, Eric mentioned uh, instruments of national power in his last briefing. I'm going to just to kind of this is review for a lot of people. However, you know this is how various administrations can look at how to influence other nations and how to kind of establish their their way in the world. And if you look across these, when you look at the diplomatic column, resupply and embassies, recognition, negotiations, treaties, policies, international forums. And then we slide over to the I with informational. This could be public diplomacy. 
You know, this could be the military side is in the and military operations where you could you could, in theory, you could put troops and cargo to get to a certain place in time very quickly. And at the very last bullet there, the size and composition of the force would have to be appropriate for a, a rocket, SpaceX or whatever company it happens to be. And my imagination, my ma imagine, I imagine that similar to cargo aircraft, where we've got a C-5, which is the largest cargo aircraft, a C-17, C-130. You know, there may be a need for different types of uh, cargo or troop transport that is a uh, you know, point to point space transport, but finally the economic one, the trade policies. So I think this, Point to point space transport has much more than military capabilities, which is what Colonel Ladd was talking about. And that's where the Department of Defense and Transcom, if I hear you right, is just, hey, okay, what can we piggyback on that the, the commercial world is already using? And various administrations like to pull different levers in this acronym. You know, we saw the previous administration really, uh, if you're applying sanctions to different countries for whatever reason, but you can imagine a country in a time of need that needs quick humanitarian relief, whether that's medical, uh, or you have a typhoon in the Philippines, there's just a number of scenarios where we need to get stuff to a country that whatever has happened, it's preventing airports from being open, ports being open, railways, so on and so forth. This thing has an amazing capability beyond the military. Just wanted to share that real quick. Um, Colonel Ladd, any thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. And, you know, to the to the dime piece that uh, you brought up, there's um, and and to the fact that we're looking to piggyback, uh, really to make this capability useful for U.S. Transportation Command and the DoD uh, writ large is we don't want to be the primary customer of this uh, capability. We want to be among the users of it because if the DoD is the primary user, uh, it creates a, a couple of issues. One obviously is cost. Uh, if we're the only ones paying for it. But the second is, what is this rocket that's going up and coming back down doing? You know, nobody thinks twice when we charter an aircraft with uh, with um, with FedEx or, or UPS, because that is what U.S. Transportation Command does. We move about 40% of our cargo and 90% of our personnel on commercial services. Uh, and then if you think about, uh, I'm sorry, 40% uh, of our air cargo, but we also move quite a bit more via sea lift, um, just because you can get quite a bit more uh, more throughput, and that is commercial sea lift. And that's very important to note in the fact that you know, nobody thinks twice about us moving that cargo on commercial means. Um, if you're seeing a rocket go up and come back down and you know it is purely for DOD purposes, that becomes an issue for us uh, at the DOD in terms of that access uh, point that we had uh, discussed earlier. Um, to our allies, you know, as hopefully commercial ports uh, begin to um, become constructed or or um, modified uh, if in the case of modifying existing airports or seaports to support point-to-point uh, -point space transportation that is also potentially an assurance for our allies that we can truly be there at a moment's notice to uh, to provide assistance uh, in whatever form that they may require and that that doesn't necessarily mean you know starship troopers of folks coming down and and uh, starting to 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 engage in operations. It may just mean a movement of force from one location to another. As Matt had discussed, uh, you know, over 80% of the, the force is uh, in the United States. So to be able to move them, uh, I guess if you were to conceptualize it, it'd almost be like a teleporter. The fact that I can teleport forces from one, port, one part of the world uh, to another um, complicates a lot of issues for our adversaries and it also assures a lot of our allies. So it's, it's more than just, um, more than just the, the fact, and I'm sorry, and and it also provides a, a large informational advantage in the fact that, um, you know, we could get there in any in any way that uh, we wanted to, whether it's via sea lift or airlift. But the fact that we used a rocket to transport yourself uh, sends quite a large message as well. Absolutely, uh, you know, just a month after the Space Force was formed. Uh, we saw in the beginning of 2020, the interesting developments that were going on with the country between the relationships, United States and Iran, and the killing of Soleimani and Iran's response to that to our troops in Iraq. And we saw the Department of Defense build up very quickly. In fact, Transportation Command moved about 800 troops within the first 18 hours. And I think it was Tim earlier on this morning that was talking about that immediate response force that he was actually part of early in his career. So that immediate response force was moved 
you know, 800 of them moved in the first 18 hours after the Secretary of Defense gave the, gave the go-ahead. And then 3,000 personnel within the next five and a half days over to the Central Command Area of Responsibility. You can just imagine what a point-to-point -point space transport years down the road for simply deterrence. You can just send a message and say, hey, we want peace. The goal is peace and simply continue to deter adversaries from forces or from actions that you don't want them to do. And I think that is the goal of the United States Transportation Command. That's to project the joint force. So all the services, when we say joint, on a global scale, at the time and place of our elected leaders choosing, when a president says we need to move people, we need to have the freedom to do that. And this capability, still a vision, it's still a vision right now, but we're hoping it becomes a reality. It also presents dilemmas to the enemy that Colonel Ladd is talking about. Hey, maybe we don't want to do that because they ha simply having the capability can present so many multiple dilemmas that you prevent that action from, ha from happening. But uh, Michael, I think Colonel Ladd and I are going to, looking at the time, we're going to stop there, but we'd be happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, I really want to stress uh, some of the things that, that, that Wolf said yesterday, nobody wants a war in space, right? That, that, uh, you know, we've talked about kind of some of the public perception problems, but, but the capabilities of the Department of Defense writ large are, are pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, I wrote in the chat, I, I personally would love to see uh, you know, not wishing anything bad on on Haiti, but you know when they were basically crippled by an earthquake a bunch of years ago, uh, when Puerto Rico was basically crippled by a uh, hurricane not that long ago, uh, crippled is the right word. They lost phones, they lost telephone systems, they lost computers, they lost power. Basically, they were dropped back into the Stone Age in about 24 hours. So what kind of capabilities does this sort of technology provide to folks in need? Colonel Ladd, I'll give that to you. Yeah. Um, really, it's just the, the immediacy of being able to provide that, that aid. Uh, one, one thing that we're obviously going to have to work through is how do you onload and offload cargo? How do you, um, how do you land in... Uh, areas that uh, you may not be able to test whether it's able to um, support the structure that is that is landing there. Obviously, that is for commercial industry to figure out. And as they attempt to um, build uh, vehicles that can land on the moon or Mars, um, right. th those are austere environments. So are uh, so those are the same kind of environments. Obviously, on a different planet. Uh, when we try and try and land them on Earth uh, to support. Uh, a disaster relief uh, operation. So uh, in terms of what we provide, it would, you know, medicine, food, hopefully personnel at some point um, to be able to get to the point of need that that is required. And it's interesting to think about in the fact that when you're talking about these sorts of scenarios, we only need to get there fast. We mm -hmm. can come back very slowly. So right. just because you launch a rocket there doesn't mean the rocket needs to launch back. We can bring it back slowly, potentially, if... Uh, if, if the, the structure, obviously, in, in terms of the locations that you're landing in uh, would allow, otherwise you'd more than likely have to, to launch it back out. But um, to be able to, to meet that immediacy is, is really probably the most important part. Well, as a long ago 0431 embarkation specialist, uh, as a corporal, uh, the idea of getting stuff from where it is to where it needs to be is pretty darned important. So uh, I'm s certainly saluting your uh, your efforts. What kind of pushback, what kind of um, you know, resistance have you gotten from this idea? And especially the commercial, right? You stressed, we don't think twice about using commercial planes to move folks around. We don't think twice about moving via ship, what kind of resistance have you got from the idea and then from the idea by doing a commercial? 
Uh, from the idea, we haven't actually gotten a lot of a lot of pushback. I think I think there are a lot of uh, naysayers in the fact they just don't think it can occur. Uh, of course, that wrong. is that 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 is that is not our um, that is not our piece to work. That is on uh, on industry to to determine. And I, I I'd like to think they're they're working their way there, whether it's Blue Origin or SpaceX or uh, United Launch Alliance. You know that is that is their piece to work on it. Um, in terms of, I'm sorry, what was the last, the second part of your question? Well, the the commercialization piece of it. I mean, that yeah. is really, you know, it's one thing, it's revolutionary to be able to point to point rocketry, bring anything you need, but then let's go to the commercial sector and source it from folks like Blue Origin or SpaceX or somebody. Um, we haven't really received too much pushback uh, on that section of it. I will say that, you know, the national space policy does direct us to, to utilize commercial assets for yep. space for space launch as it is right now, so we we do need to follow uh, national policy uh, in that respect. And there is no or you know, there is no uh, organic. And when I say organic, I suppose I mean there is no DoD unique uh, space launch vehicle. We we always go to commercial. So this would really be not this would not be a departure from the way in which we currently uh, execute space launch. Terrific. Um, do you I and I don't, sorry what yeah i just wanted to add a piece there that, um one of the one of the highlights that the four star in charge of u.s transportation command highlighted in his annual speech in october was a number that might shock a few people but dod spends seven billion dollars a year on transportation services so as colonel ladd was saying wow. when you're when you're paying commercial ships rail or aircraft, it's not cheap. And I think it would it would fall in this category. Of course, it would have to be a prioritization on how quickly do you need to get it there? Is it a national, um, when we go back to that dime, how, how important is this to message either um, bringing goodwill or a show of force to a potential adversary? But I think $7 billion a year is, is not a small number that we spend on transportation services alone on the commercial side. That's not military ships and airplanes. Just thought I'd throw that out. Well, I mean, actually, I didn't know that. That's actually a really interesting piece of news to me. What is that? That's a quarter of NASA's entire budget, just to put that in perspective, right? Um, and the Space Force's new budget, it's only double that, right? So that $7 billion pushes everybody wherever they need to go for the entire DOD, but that's only ha that's half of the space force's current budget and that's a quarter of nasa's current budget so that's that's a really big number i had no idea it was that large that's amazing um, yeah i think it speaks to the the importance of logistics when you think about a national and a global force the united states is is a transportation command is a global command and when you add a new combatant command so that's essentially a new customer you have a new combatant command that's 100 kilometers and above over the entire surface. Uh, that's huge. So, that, you know, and if this vision becomes a reality, that number may grow on, on what we spend annually. But I think Colonel Ladd did a good job of describing that these are not, you know, it's not going to say United States Air Force on it. This, these are commercial options. It's in line with space policy. And I think it's, it's a fantastic option. Well, we're certainly looking forward to hearing more uh uh, Colonel Ladd, really appreciate your your comments and and frankly your vision. Uh, and and uh, Matt, really appreciate you coming on board and bringing bringing this uh, to our event. Uh, we are going to switch over. Can you just answer some crystal ball question? Do you think this is going to happen anytime soon? And define soon. And we have to move on. So fast answer, please. Okay. Um, I. I think in terms of a capability that's uh, capable of going up and back down for to support point to point space transportation, I would like to think it would at least occur sometime in the next five years. Now, whether that's going to be something that is going to uh, normalize in frequency, so that way it's something similar to what you're seeing with uh, international air travel, I think that's something that's gonna take a little bit longer. And that's really where US Transportation Command wants to fit in is when it becomes more normalized because it, it meets a lot of our needs in terms of cost, uh, capacity, speed, and access. 
Terrific. Thank you all very much, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Jordan, we're going to take it over to you. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you very much. As a former Army Ranger, I used to be cargo in the back of those C-5s and C-17s for many flights over to Germany. Uh, any efficiency in that process is much appreciated.